Hi, this is Jeff Matavetsky from Binghamton University. My research group focuses on the interplay between nanoscale structure and optimal electronic properties and functional materials. In this talk, I'll briefly outline our recent work with using atomic force microscope methods to unravel nanoscale structure function links in organic and perovskite solar cells. Organic and perovskite solar cells are promising for a wide range of applications beyond solar farms because of their potential for low cost processing from solution, their mechanical flexibility, lightweight, tunable light absorption, and efficiency under low light. These attributes make organic and perovskite solar cells candidates for indoor light harvesting, disaster response, window integration, and other novel applications. I'll start with charge percolation in organic solar cells. Organic solar cells rely on a nanostructured, so-called bulk heterojunction morphology for efficient charge photogeneration. In the bulk heterojunction, there's an interpenetrating network of electron donating and electron accepting domains, which leads to complex pathways for charge transport. The electrons need to find their way through the electron accepting phase and holes move through the electron donating phase. Since device scale measurements provide little insight into the local electrical properties produced by the nanoscale morphology, we've been developing characterization approaches based on conductive atomic force microscopy to learn about the local electrical properties of photovoltaic materials. Conductive AFM involves using a metal coated AFM probe as a movable nanoscale electrical contact by applying a voltage between the probe and a counter electrode, current can be measured through the intervening material. We've used conductive AFM to map the conductive grain structure in conducting polymer films, to measure charge tunneling across molecular monolayers, to measure transistor characteristics in single nanowires, and also to trigger, trigger local reactions to pattern conductive paths in single insulating graphene oxide sheets. For quantitative insight into the local electrical performance of solar cell materials, we've been developing point by point current voltage mapping. This approach involves bringing a metal coated probe into contact with the sample using a controlled force, measuring a local current voltage curve, retracting the probe, and then moving to the next sample location. By analyzing thousands of current voltage curves, we can construct nanoscale charge carrier mobility maps. And as I'll show later, local photovoltaic parameters can also be spatially mapped with nanoscale resolution. We've used this PPIV approach to track the dependence of local hole mobility in organic bulk heterojunctions. As you can see here for a small molecule bulk heterojunction, the hole mobility and conductive domain size generally increase uh, with the amount of donor component and with the addition of DIO that promotes donor acceptor phase separation. So interestingly, we can see that in small molecule bulk heterojunctions shown at the top here, whole conductive regions are quite isolated from one another, while in a polymer system shown at the bottom, the whole transport regions are more interconnected. This effect can also be seen in line profiles with the hole mobility decreasing more gradually near hole mobility hotspots in the polymer system. This result suggests that lateral electrical connectivity in the polymer bulk heterojunction allows for more spatially uniform charge collection, probably resulting from charge transport along the polymer backbone. Further evidence for a role played by lateral charge transport pathways was provided by percolation analysis of the average hole mobility as a function of active layer composition. We fit the data near the percolation threshold, in other words, in the composition range where charge can barely flow, to find the critical exponent that varies with the dimensionality of the system. This analysis shows that the percolation process in bulk heterojunctions is fundamentally three-dimensional and that lateral and vertical pathways are both essential for charge flow. This is in contrast to the typical case of a single component film. In single component films, we think of charge flow 
as being uniformly along one direction. However, in bulk header junctions, the acceptor material shown in yellow here acts as an excluded volume for hole transport, leading to roundabout charge transport pathways. So how does this impact our understanding about ways to improve charge collection in organic solar cells? Well, in the single component case with charge flow in one direction, a common strategy for improving charge transport in organic semiconductors is to align the molecular pi pi stacking direction with the direction of charge flow. As shown in a number of studies, organic transistor performance can be significantly improved when molecules are stacked in an edge-on configuration to promote in-plane charge flow. Similarly, we've seen that when molecules are induced to stack in a face-on orientation, the out-of-plane charge mobility can be increased by an order of magnitude. A similar strategy has been applied to bulk header junction solar cells to promote out-of-plane charge transport, and there are examples of increased charge carrier mobilities and power conversion efficiencies. However, the assumption has generally been that more face-on stacking is good and edge-on stacking is detrimental. So in other words, the conventional thinking is that the more you increase the amount of face-on stacking, the more you will uh, improve charge transport efficiency. To test this, we performed a set of experiments with the well-studied P3HT PCBM system, where we systematically varied the molecular orientation of the polymer donor P3HT. Based on grazing incidence X-ray diffraction measurements performed at Brookhaven's NSLS2 synchrotron, we determined the proportion of edge-on and face-on populations as the annealing temperature of the bulk header junction was varied. As you can see here, as we increased the annealing temperature, the edge-on stacking population increased relative to the face-on population. So at lower temperatures, there's a nearly one-to-one -one ratio of face-on and edge-on populations. And then at higher annealing temperatures, the edge-on population is about 30 times higher than the face-on population. We then used a new conductive atomic force microscope approach to quantify the lateral current spreading during out-of-plane charge transport. I won't have time to describe this method in detail, but you can find further information in the applied physics letters reference shown below. Briefly, it involves depositing an array of micro-patterned electrodes on the active layer, and then comparing the current when the probe is in direct contact with the film, which leads to current spreading, and when the probe is in contact with a microelectrode, which leads to little spreading relative to the microelectrode size. So using this approach to quantify lateral current spreading, we see as expected that when the amount of edge on stacking is increased, lateral current spreading also increases. This is because in-plane pi pi stacking will promote lateral charge flow. Next, we looked at the out-of-plane hole current, which shows a maximum near 195 degrees Celsius. This is interesting because the maximum current is not at the lower annealing temperatures, where there's a greater amount of face-on stacking. This result shows that having a balance of in-plane and out-of-plane pathways is helpful for efficient charge flow. We also saw that molecular orientation played a stronger role than the degree of crystallinity. Since overall crystallinity increased as the annealing temperature increased, but the whole current actually decreased, it didn't increase as expected for a more crystalline sample. We attribute the low currents at high annealing temperatures to the extensive edge on molecular stacking that limited out of plane charge flow. In summary, we see that lateral connectivity plays a key role in bulk header junctions. And there needs to be a balance between vertical and lateral transport pathways for efficient performance. Yeah. I'll next briefly introduce some of our work on perovskite systems. Using the same point by point mapping approach outlined earlier, we measured local current voltage characteristics in methyl ammonium lead iodide films under solar simulator light. We were then able to construct maps of the local photocurrent 
open circuit voltage and other photovoltaic parameters. Interestingly, we saw that the open circuit voltage showed an increase at some grain edges. To investigate the cause of the increased open circuit voltage at grain boundaries, we used Kelvin probe force microscopy and second harmonic piezo force microscopy, which both show an elevated response at grain boundaries. The increased surface potential me measured by Kelvin probe is associated with N-type doping, while the second harmonic PFM signal has been connected with cation motion. I'll talk a bit more about the evidence for ionic motion since this measurement approach is rather new. During second harmonic PFM measurements, we applied an AC bias to the probe while the probe is in contact with the sample. We then record the second harmonic oscillation of the probe due to surface displacements of the sample. As illustrated on the bottom left, we propose that when an AC bias is applied, lattice distortion during methyl ammonium ion migration leads to surface displacements at twice the applied bias frequency. One of the pieces of evidence in support of a cation motion mechanism comes from applying a DC bias in between the PFM measurements. So we can see on the right side, when we apply a positive DC bias to the probe in between PFM measurements, there's a minor effect on the PFM imaging contrast. However, if we apply a negative DC bias to the probe, the positively charged uh, mobile cations will be attracted to the sample surface, and that leads to this streaky appearance shown here. Subsequent imaging shows also that there are new protrusions that form at the surface of the sample as a result of this cation accumulation. These signatures of cation motion and nanoscale degradation are only observed under combined stimulation with light and voltage, with the light acting to soften the perovskite lattice and faci facilitate ionic motion. The observed light and voltage-induced cation motion can play an important role in optoelectronic device operation and degradation. In terms of the elevated open circuit voltage at grain boundaries that I showed earlier, we attribute this to two effects. First, the increased surface potential at grain boundaries is associated with N-type doping and local downward band bending. Second, cation accumulation at grain boundaries can deepen local band bending. This band bending can locally attract electrons and repel holes, leading to reduced charge carrier recombination and an increased open circuit voltage at grain boundaries. In summary, we used newly developed conductive probe methods to assess the nanoscale functional properties of emerging photovoltaic materials. We saw that in organic solar cells, charge percolation relies on a balance of in-plane and out-of-plane charge transport channels, which challenges the conventional wisdom that face-on molecular stacking should be maximized. Finally, we saw that an elevated open circuit voltage at grain boundaries in methyl ammonium lead iodide perovskite solar cells can be related to preferential n-type doping and cation accumulation at grain boundaries. Cation motion near grain boundaries can also lead to local structural changes and possible degradation in devices. I'd like to acknowledge my research team and in particular Jeremy Mehta, Haiyan Q, and Pravini Fernando who played key roles in the experiments that I showed. I'd also like to thank the National Science Foundation for supporting this work. Thanks for listening.